Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Madam Cronin. I'm Brett Ewer. And today we're discussing what's next for Afghanistan and the world. Brett, thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, always good to be on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so the reason we brought you back on is something pretty momentous has just recently happened. The U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan after occupying the country for more than 20 years. After spending more than $2 trillion, that's more than $300 million per day, and after sacrificing over 2,300 American lives and 75,000 Afghani lives. And within hours of U.S. troops withdrawing from Afghanistan, the U.S.-backed government under President Ashraf Ghani collapsed, and the Taliban took over not only Kabul and Afghanistan, but also all the equipment and money that the U.S. had left behind. So my questions that I want to talk about in this episode are, was it worth it? (laughs) Should the U.S. have gone into Afghanistan in the first place? Once in Afghanistan, what should the U.S. have done differently? And what does America's defeat signify about the changing role of America and other poles of power within the world? So I think, you know, a good place to start off would be a quote from... Antonio Garcia's Martinez, which I actually DM to you on Twitter, where we started talking about this episode and the need to address this, where he said, quote, I don't know about you, but the Afghanistan thing has me utterly bent out of shape. Rare these days to feel that giddy rush of history happening before our eyes. But this was it. Something has clicked on the cosmic order. An era is over and matters will forever be different. So first, I just want to ask you, do you have a similar sense that this is a pretty momentous signifier, um, you know, before we get into the specifics? Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, aside from just, you know, the media's coverage of it, where you have the, you know, the shot by shot or side by side of, you know, Saigon and then and then Kabul, uh, it definitely seems momentous, if not for the fact that it was literally 20 years um, mm-hmm. or, or just short of 20 years of engagement. I mean, how can that not define, I mean, you're talking 20 years, that's like a generation. That's literally, <laughs> there are people who were yeah. born, who are born and are adults today who have known in both Afghanistan and the United States and other countries that were involved who have known nothing, but there is conflict in this country and it's ongoing. And so of course it's going to be momentous, um, just by virtue of how long it is, let alone the level of, you know, the various, um, intensities along the way. Right. Yeah, it feels like the reality on the ground had been pretty abysmal for a while now. But when America withdrew and the government collapsed right away within a matter of hours, not weeks or months, it felt like a bubble burst. The bubble of what people thought was going on, the bubble of what people thought America's role was and how you know powerful America may be internationally. And it seems like there is maybe a a power vacuum forming. So I definitely want to get into what's likely to fill that vacuum and how other poles of power may respond. But first, I think it would be really useful for us to do almost like a postmortem of the whole Afghanistan situation and just think like, what could we have done differently? What, What could we learn from this? And what are the important lessons to take away for the future? So the first thing I want to ask you as it relates to that is, should America have gone into Afghanistan militarily in the first place? So right after 9-11, Edward Snowden had a great line in his recent Substack post where he said, I, like many Americans after 9-11, wanted to pick up Afghanistan and shake out all the terrorists like snakes out of a boot. And I think a lot of people felt that after the 9-11 attacks. But by going into Afghanistan militarily, without actually declaring war, and it was unclear who we were actually fighting, it put America in a precarious position. And it also seemed to elevate the terrorists to a level of peers, like they were a peer of ours by going in and having a war on terror rather than taking some sort of police action in conjunction with other countries. But I'm curious to get your thoughts on should we have gone into Afghanistan in the first place? Um, And if not, what should we have done instead? Yeah, I mean, I say all of this with the caveat of like, I'm not an international relations expert, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just opining here. So take what you will from that. Um, you know, I think looking back, it's easy now to see with 20 years of hindsight, that we should have had a much more concerted police intervention, um, and that it should have been a little bit more uh, global in its, um, uh, you know, in the coalition that was going in, 
um, which I think it originally was. I mean, there was a, you know, the United States is a member of NATO. There was an attack on a NATO country. And so a bunch of NATO nations went in um, to intervene. The question is, is, you know, how long should we have been there? Um, and, you know, if was the total goal, the end goal was to find the mastermind of the 9-11 attacks, Osama bin Laden, um, you know, if the goal was to root him out, uh, you know, we weren't successful for the first 10 years. So, uh, you know, I, I think... And once we got him, we, he wasn't even in Afghanistan. He was in Pakistan <laughs> when U.S. forces finally shot him. <laughs> yeah, of course. And I mean, it's also it's also almost silly. You know, I know very little about Pakistan's internal uh, governance, but my understanding is that the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan is fairly permeable, right? So, I mean, you're dealing less with, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to find someone in an area that's sort of ill-defined and doesn't really, it sort of belies the idea of a nation state going to war against the government of another nation right. state, right? And that's how we approached it. So I don't think we can be super surprised that with that approach, that we were looking for success through that path. It always seemed like our goal needed to be to find a particular person and a particular group of people that committed a terrorist act. And we went just balls to the wall. I mean, we went like zero to 90 and deployed military. Um, you know, rather than- yeah, it really did seem similar to Vietnam in the sense that we went in there. We didn't have a clear opposing army that we were going to fight in a field battle like a traditional military would. And whether it's when the British were occupying Afghanistan or the Russians were occupying Afghanistan or the U.S. were occupying Afghanistan, every time it follows a similar pattern where you have this global power enter and try to handle the situation as a traditional military would. But the Afghanistan people and the Taliban do not like to fight openly. Instead, they recede into the hills, they recede into the mountains, and then they just pick you off one by one over years or decades. And they're incredibly patient because they have these very strong religious beliefs on their side. And so when you have like a bureaucratic overextended global power fighting against those really strong religious beliefs and just knowing the terrain and having the support of tribal elders and local people, it becomes almost an unwinnable task if your goal is basically to export America's way of life to a people that doesn't want America's, or at least not everyone wants it, or a critical mass of people that want it. Yeah, and I think you touch on something there that carries not just for Afghanistan, but for probably any country is that when you have an invading, occupying force, people aren't really going to take that well. <laughs> there's right. always going to be, there's you know, because of the vast scale of the war machine of modern war, there's always going to be, uh, or seems to always be, collateral damage that is real. That's people's real lives who are ended um, you know, people who were either legitimate military targets or weren't, or civilians, and that engenders hatred on the part of people who are living there, who are, you know, on the receiving end of just, you know, the brute force of, of an invasion, uh, of an invasion force. And so, you know, I think, I think any place that would be on the receiving end that would be invaded like Afghanistan was probably would react in a similar way. You'd have a lot of people who, uh, you know, a lot of people who know the terrain better than, you know, they live in the country, they know the terrain, they're dealing with local institutions that they know. Um, and then there's a new entity or force that comes in. Of course, I think there's going to be some, uh, you know, merited resistance there. So I think we both agreed we should never have entered Afghanistan militarily. If anything, it should have been a political action done in concert with other countries. But once there, the next question I have for you is, if we do enter Afghanistan, and first thing we did, 2001, we toppled the Taliban rule, what was the right time for us to leave? Was it in 2001, right after we toppled the Taliban? Or maybe after that, we were still concerned that there could be another attack. So maybe after 2004, once NATO forces were fully there and there was the first establishment of the Afghan government, maybe in 2009, after Obama's troop surge, where we pushed back the Taliban to, I think, the furthest extent that we had throughout the war, or in 2011, after killing Osama bin Laden, or in 2014, after NATO combat mission ended, or in 2021, when 
we did follow through with what Trump had negotiated. So there's many times where we could have left and many ways in which we could have left. I'm curious what you think would have been the best way for us to leave after having gone there in the first place. Yeah, I think, you know, going along the lines of we're there to specifically hunt down uh, a person who committed, you know, and planned a terrorist act against the United States and that you're there for a police action it seems like the justification would would end with uh, with the killing of Osama bin Laden. And so to, what was that, 2011, I think, May of 2011? Right, 2011. But then I can also understand the idea of, okay, you're there. Now you need to make sure that it can stick, that things won't just immediately go into chaos because that, you know, because you'd get blamed for that too, obviously. And there would be a horrible outcome there as well. Um you know, I think probably the most justifiable would be when, uh, what was it? The You said it was the end of authorization for NATO? Yeah, so in 2014, NATO's combat mission ended. And that was basically when most NATO troops had pulled out. I, I think that generally the mandate for the world's intervention there, or at least the U.S.'s substantive intervention there, um, you know, would end with, the, the killing or the bring you know bringing to justice of the person who uh, conducted the nine and conducted and planned the 911 attacks and then giving that enough time to set up some kind of a government that would be able to stand on its own and then you know if NATO declared the combat mission to be over I think that would be incumbent on the US to work within that framework and follow their lead and then depart so I'd probably say 2014. I mean, this gets up to the question of should we have been in Afghanistan for the purpose of nation building or simply for the purpose of protecting America's security and bringing the people who attacked America on 9-11 to justice? And it seems like we kind of flip flopped. We started purely about it's all about protecting America. If you remember during the George W. Bush era, it was all about those weapons of mass destruction. And we got to make sure they don't launch nukes at us, even though it became very clear afterwards they didn't have nukes or anything like that. Mm. And then it, it became a nation building effort, a symbol of liberalism, almost like showing the power of liberal values, democratic values. And I mean, you think, look at it historically, and it's like after the Soviet Union fell in the 1970s, Francis Fukuyama wrote the book, The End of History. And people had this notion of, okay, great, we defeated communism. Now everyone's just going to be democratic capitalists and it'll all be fine. And then NATO was established. And it seems like with the Afghanistan withdrawal, that dream, the bubble of that dream burst. And people realized there are other forces at play here that we need to grapple with. And liberal values aren't going to win out inevitably. They have to be fought hard for. And there has to be a will from the people themselves to have those values win out. It can't just be something exerted on you from some external force. Yeah, I don't know if it's some kind of irony or some kind of paradox to try to force liberal thinking on someone, right? That's like the counter, right, right? that's right. counterintuitive to the idea of, um, I guess, I don't know, maybe the paradox of tolerance or something. I, I, you know, I'll leave that to, to the philosophers. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it certainly signals that, you know, there is, that there are competing visions for the world and that merely uh, using force to try to say, hey, this is how your society must act, uh, it, it just isn't tenable, at least in that instance. Um, and I think that, you know, that could, that could potentially be extended to you know, other countries and other interventions as well. Um, I think something that's important to note is, you know, a lot of people talk about the history of Afghanistan, right? That there's uh, the, you know, the British wars there, I think there were three wars that the British conducted in Afghanistan, that their, that their occupation failed, that the Soviet occupation failed. Um, I think it's too soon to say, but probably that the U.S. occupation failed. I mean, it depends on what, what your metrics are. Uh, but something I think is so interesting is people look at those and then they compare them to, you know, they say, well, the Mongols took over or... Alexander the Great and the Greeks took over, but something that I think right. is... Or the Persian Empire. Right. And, you know, not touching on the Mongols, because I don't really know the intricacies of their rule that well, but I do know that for, for the Greeks and for the Alexandrian, you know, Macedonian Empire and all that, it was less 
direct occupation and more of just settling in that area. You just had soldiers that moved there and they said, well, there's a lot of land here. And then, you know, they set up the kingdoms of the Bactrian Greeks. It was much more along the lines of a sort of colonialism, a settler colonialism, rather than just, uh, you know, a colonialism of creating an out- outpost and extracting resources that go to a, a you know, an imperial hub or something like that. Um, but I just, I figured that was worth mentioning because when we look at all of the grand scale of the history of interventions in Afghanistan, I often see these sort of false equivalencies or these false uh, contrasts. And I figure it's worth, you know, just fleshing them out. It's fascinating to look at the history of Afghanistan and People also point out that its geography is so important for what its role in the world is because it's got this massive mountain range in the middle that kind of separates the north from the south. So it makes it harder to be unified and it kind of creates these like tribal divisions are just easier to pop up based on the geography. And you mentioned during Alexander the Great's rule and his whole empire, it was sort of like the Siberia of for the Greeks where they would exile people to Afghanistan. So it was kind of like a like a borderland, like place where you would exile people. But then it was before it was the graveyard of empires. It was kind of a birthplace of empires. And you mentioned the Mughals and they had their summer camp in Kabul. And so when it was really cold, they would come to Kabul and they would run their operations from there. And you mentioned that, you know, the British were the first semi-modern global power to occupy it. And the reason why they occupied it is because they were worried that, the Afghanistan people would ally themselves with the Russians. And so they basically were like, hey, we got to have the ear of the Afghani people so that they don't ally themselves with the Russians. And this is kind of the same pattern that repeats itself over and over again, where after the British finally have this horrible defeat, and then the Russians make the same exact kind of mistake. And then basically when they leave Afghanistan, that's the end of the USSR. So that was a very, very much a bookend to that whole chapter of world history. And then with America, it was the same kind of thing. It's like, look, Afghanistan shares a border with China. It's really important geographically because it kind of ties together the East with the West and the North with the South. It has valuable resources, valuable oil. The petrodollar system relies on how the oil relates to the dollar. All of these are reasons why Afghanistan is important beyond just its being a place that has lots of oppression from a liberal point of view. Yeah. And I see that from a crossroads perspective, you know, I don't know how, I think it's something like 40 million people live in Afghanistan. Um, And I don't know how many people have existed through history in proportion to other population centers nearby, but I would bet that there are fewer people there than there are uh, in the Indian subcontinent or in, you know, Eastern China or in Iran or in the steppes just north of it um, in all of the Stan countries. And so it, it is a crossroads for all of these uh, powers, you know, whether that's the Persian Empire or whether it's the, um, the civilizations along, you know, in, in along the Indus and in India. Uh, so it always seems like it's, I hate to say it's like a natural flashpoint, but it does seem to be a pretty consistent point of contention. Um, it's a borderland where, where, large, uh, you know, forces end up clashing. Yeah. Now, I want to talk about who really benefited from the war. And when you look at just the amount of money we spent there, I mean, I heard one story where President Ashraf Ghani left Kabul with $169 million in cash fluttering from his helicopter. And he didn't tell anyone he was leaving. He just up and left. And we talked about the bubble bursting. And part of that bubble bursting is that on paper, it looked like we had an incredible amount of forces at the ready in Afghanistan. We had all of these troops. They were one of the best equipped armies in the world. And Biden was talking about how great they are and how you know amazing it is and the efforts we've done. And then it turns out it was pretty much only that. It was just on paper. There was so much money sloshing around that, yeah, sure, a lot of Afghani people were willing to take those dollars and do various activities while Americas are overseeing. But as soon as the Americans leave, they didn't have any buy-in. They didn't really care. They weren't willing to put their life on the line for a corrupt government that was put in from an external global superpower. 
I've heard that uh, I've heard that for a lot of the ANA soldiers, the, Na- the Afghan National Army, that a lot of them simply and the police too simply weren't paid. <laughs> so of course, of course, they're not going to put their lives on the line. I mean, if there's no level of inculcated discipline or incentive for them to buy in, I mean, if you're not getting paid, then why would you do? You know, I mean, why would you do a job if you're not getting paid? Um, and if it's simply going to some, you know, higher up who's just siphoning it away, then, you know, of course things are going to crumble. Um, and why someone might be corrupt in that instance and siphon away those funds for personal use is because perhaps they don't, you know, they earnestly don't believe in the project. They could just say, well, I don't want a liberal democracy. Or they might think, that this is just outside of the realm of comprehension for working within that culture or within that system. Um, and, you know, I only, I think that the only way that you could create a system where that's expected within the culture, I mean, is literally through, you'd be culturally astroturfing. I mean, you'd have to bring in like topsoil, you know, metaphorically speaking, you'd bring in topsoil where the expectation is that you have, you know, all of these liberal rights and something. And then that raises the question of like, is it right for a force to come in and tell people how they should live their lives? Um, You know, at what line is that justified? Is it justified if women are being, you know, systemically abused and and shut out from society? I'm not going to answer any of these questions because they're really weighty and I haven't given them enough thought, uh, you know. Well, one question I've been thinking about, is Afghanistan better off today? if the U.S. had never entered Afghanistan, or are they worse off? Because on the one hand, you could say they're worse off because if we had never entered Afghanistan, they would have had 20 years of being able to self-determine their own future. And maybe it probably would have been a very different path than America has taken in progressing. But maybe because it was their own path, they would be further along now than they would have otherwise. On the other hand, maybe because America enabled 20 years of people to grow up and for girls to get an education and for them to be exposed to these Western values, maybe now that we're leaving, yes, it's true the Taliban are in power, but you also have a citizenry that has been much more exposed to Western values and maybe therefore it will progress more rapidly than if we had never entered there. Uh, Curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that's Kind of the central question is if you are indeed engaged in a project of cultural change, inculcation, bringing in the topsoil to, you know, to uh, continue that metaphor, um, would 20 years be enough? And, you know, it's almost a, it's an interesting counterfactual to kind of chew on is, you know, but for our getting involved, would there have been the current state of things in Afghanistan would you know would women feel free to go get an education and then you know you have to weigh that against how much did it cost just in terms of treasure but then also in more importantly in people's lives and weigh that against you know what would have probably transpired had the Taliban just continued to rule there without any kind of social change which you know was i mean let alone people, let alone repressing half of the population, um, you know, women where they're only allowed to, you know, pretty much just be in homes, taking into account also the repression of any other minorities, religious, you know, LGBT, I mean, just any kind of social minority you can think of, and all of the horror that comes with living in a fundamentalist society when you are a member of that minority, and Heck, not even considering minorities. What about just basic due process rights, right? I mean, like, is it right for your hand to be cut off if you're a thief? Uh, I wouldn't say so, but, you know, so you have to weigh all of these things. Um, and I just wish I had a better sense of, you know, it's hard to be a judge of that, right? Yeah, it is really hard from our Western point of view to imagine what it's like for an Afghani living there, especially when you think about why is the Taliban so popular and powerful relative to America? I mean, a lot of people thought that there's no way that this group of unorganized backwards people are going to be able to very quickly take over all of the major cities in Afghanistan in a concerted effort. And it's pretty impressive and surprising to a lot of Westerners to see how successful the Taliban were 
And when you look at the history of the Taliban, they were really created as a reaction to external powers coming into mm-hmm. Afghanistan. And so they kind of became almost like a heroes among you know, more rural areas where they were seen as people who would come up. It was totally decentralized movement. It's not like there's like one leader of the Taliban. It's, it really is like a decentralized movement. And they would basically kick out the, the invaders and they would establish a religious rule where it was more in line with their, their faith. And so you can sort of see the attraction of that. And some people have even drawn parallels to, this might be unfair, but for instance, like the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, which was from people who were very nationalistic, very religious. They wanted to return to traditional values. I think it was maybe like Michael Moore, the filmmaker, but he's like, they've got a Taliban, we've got a Taliban, everyone's got a Taliban. I don't think that's fair, yeah. but there is something to those like common features of uh, sort of like conservatism, progressivism, and, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think when people feel threatened, whether that's by, you know, a change to the order that they grew up in, um, and that's speaking very broadly, change to the order that they grew up in, whether that's through legitimate social movements and change and people being free to speak out about what they don't like, as in the U.S., um, versus, you know, an occupying force coming in. I think for both of those things, there's going to be reaction. And I think for many people, they cling to elements of culture and what they know and what they're comfortable with. And sometimes that manifests through religion. Um, uh, Comparing, I think, you know, the people at the Capitol on January 6th, the people who were, you know, breaking into the Capitol and and doing all that. I think that that's, I think comparing them to the Taliban is quite a stretch, but you can see the, you, you can see kind of the underlying themes and currents that we should be wary of. Yeah, I agree. Well, let me ask you this. What lessons should the U.S. take away from this 20-year campaign in Afghanistan? If you were Biden and, and you were briefing whether the American public or your cabinet or members of NATO, what would you say as like, here's what we've learned, here's what we should do differently next time? You know, I would say very broadly, it's that if we're going to do something, it should be with the uh, it should be with more assent from the global community. Um, you know, if you want to have a moral high ground, which is necessary if you're trying to place a culture onto another group of people, right? Like taking the tenets of liberalism and putting them on a place that might not traditionally be liberal. Uh, you need to have most of the world agreeing that that's a good thing. Um, so I think that, you know, that does sort of break down the unipolar approach that we've had since the end of the end of the, of the Cold War, um, you know, since the early 90s. Um, but the world is changing. And I think it's important for any action taken really by any country that is, you know, that goes beyond the, bo- the bounds of, of, of controlling itself internally, um, you know, requires... Uh, requires some buy-in from the rest of the global community. So that's what I would say. If I were yeah. advising the president, I would say for any time that we get involved with something larger, we really need to have, you know, the back, uh, our traditional allies need to have our back in doing this. And also I think countries that are emerging um, that are going to have more of a say in the future should also, you know, have a say in this and should you know be in a position uh, to agree um, so that, you know, going forward, anything that's being done is viewed by most of the world as being the right thing to do. Right. Yeah, we shouldn't foist our own way of life on anyone else, especially not via military force. And the other big lessons I was thinking of, I mean, obviously never get involved in a land war in Asia. That's like right, yeah. basic <laughs> military knowledge. It's like That's like fifth grade risk. That's like, yeah. <laughs> like, come on. No, you, you never, you know, you're going to spread your forces too thin and all that. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, also there's Afghanistan being the graveyard of empires. So we right. could have probably learned from that. And then I, the biggest lesson from my point of view is that it's not enough to have a military prowess. We also need belief. We need buy-in. We need alignment of values. I mean, I almost view it as like you have these orbs of power, of conscious power, 
that are taking place in the world. You have the orb of sort of a traditional American state, which is somewhat combined with like wokeism or like the New York Times or the ability to cancel people because they don't quite align with Western values. Like that is one orb of power. And then you also have the orb of power of authoritarianism, which I would say is embodied by the Chinese Communist Party, where it's it's limiting access to information, limiting freedom so that you can maintain total control, total surveillance. And then there's a third orb of power that's emerging, which is the decentralized uh, crypto world, where it's all about a bottom up system where everyone is empowered to have privacy, to have wealth that holds its value over time, to be able to interact with other people without any sort of surveillance or suppression or limitations of speech. And so I really see it as what is so momentous about what's going on in Afghanistan is that we are seeing in real time the decline of that traditional Western power orb while the Chinese authoritarian power orb is growing. And then at the same time, we've got this like sort of stealth crypto power orb that is also growing probably even more rapidly than the growth of China and authoritarianism, but it's still kind of under the radar. And what's really interesting from my perspective is what happens next for Afghanistan? Because the U.S., And the IMF cut off all dollars going to the country. So they're going to have a currency crisis. Uh, There's a big open question about how will they be recognized or not recognized by the international community? Uh, How will other countries respond? And it seems like maybe this will be a case where cryptocurrencies will like take hold and there'll be sort of like a real case of crypto anarchy where you have like an oppressive rule under the Taliban while people still have some semblance of civilization behind closed doors via cryptography, or you might have a much worse outcome. Maybe China becomes the next global empire to enter the graveyard of, of, you know, other empires there. Uh, Curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah. I I struggle to think as, as interesting as it would be if, you know, common folk in Afghanistan started getting involved in (laughs) decentralized (laughs) currencies or, you know, or decentralized systems, you know, I think that certainly would be interesting. I feel like that's probably not likely, um, but who knows? Stranger things have happened. Um, but I think that that's an interesting framing of the world is, you know, that there's this sort of, uh, you know, traditional establishment. You can just call it for sloppy shorthand West, right? Like mm-hmm. liberal democracies, whatever you want to call it. I think people can generally create a sort of frame of understanding of what it is um, in contrast to less, uh, free places, shall we say, authoritarian countries where things are much more centrally planned and dictated, um, like China. Um, and then, you know, you do have, I don't know if I would call it like decentralized finance or crypto world or whatever, but you have this sovereign individualism might be a good way to, yeah. Or, yeah. I mean, or, you know, you have a number of people across the world who have accessed information Because now information is just so free flowing and they no longer view themselves as being necessarily tied within one different establishment bucket. And so they, they, you know, in a beautiful sense or in in a sense, it's beautiful in a way because you can, uh, you know, you recognize common humanity with people all around the world. Transcends boundaries. Of course. And that's, I mean, amazing. Um, But then, you know, whether, whether the other two groups would like that or not, you know, if it's siphoning away right. power at their expense, that remains to be seen. I think it'll be interesting to see what happens with Afghanistan, you know, just from like a, a you know traditional real politic kind of lens. Uh, you know, let's assume that if, if China were to get involved, I think that they would be much less, uh, much less concerned about the individual welfare of individual Afghanis. Um, Right. You know, it, more, it might just be more of a common sense deal of like, hey, we'll give you this money and you give us access to these lithium mines. Probably. <laughs> and yeah. we'll recognize you internationally. <laughs> yeah. And realistically, they might, uh, you know, they might give legitimacy to through the Security Council or whatever through uh, to the Taliban regime. And, you know, in return, they get some very favorable access to natural resources or, uh, you know, it's it's another outpost of their growing uh, sphere of influence. Um, I don't know, maybe they would 
exploit uh, the Taliban's penchant for repression by using uh, slave labor to extract those resources. I could see that is very likely to happen. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's also possible that the Taliban could be a total thorn in the side of China, which is dealing with, you know, ostensibly their reason for their such strong presence in, in the Xinjiang province is to clamp down on uh, extremism. Their own Muslim population. Right. And, you know, the the pretense there, I don't know whether it's justified or not. Uh, I don't I just don't have enough information. But the, the pretense is that it's to um, uh, stop terrorist activity. Uh, whether they might expand that into Afghanistan, you know, that that sort of police action or mm -hmm. or imperial action remains to be seen. But now that we're not there, the U.S. is not there. Um, it gives it a much more open playing field, certainly. Yeah, totally. Well, I think that's a good lead into the future scenarios. Let's start with the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. I mean, I think the worst case would be just brutal repression of people in Afghanistan. Again, I mean, that's you, you can't you can't set that aside. There will be brutal repression, and that's just you know just abysmal. Um, on a global scale, I think that what could be worrying is if if there is a growing um, growing legitimacy that leads to some kind of conflict between Afghanistan and, you know, Pakistan, which is a nuclear power, <laughs> you know, I, I hope people don't forget, like, both Pakistan, or Pakistan has nuclear weapons. Um, mm -hmm. Same, same with India, but you know, that naturally leads to there being, you know, if you want to put that on a color chart, like you, you know, <laughs> knock that up a few levels, it makes it yeah. much more of a, a vibrant threat. Uh, and so, you know, Maybe this is maybe this is a lame cop out, but I think the worst possible case, worst, 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 if we're getting superlatives, is uh, you know nuclear destabilization, and you have nuclear weapons that are deployed either you know through some kind of religious extremism, or who knows, simply by accident. I mean that that can happen. That's mm -hmm. why they're that's why they're so dangerous, um, and that would lead to not even just the ecological effects, but you know, the breakdown of, of political and social borders I could see easily happening. Um, so that's what yeah. I see as the worst possible, you know, um, a chain reaction where, oh, you know, maybe a nuclear weapon goes off in, I don't know, uh, somewhere in that region. And then another nuclear force misreads that as being, you know, an attempt, an attack on them. And then it causes a chain reaction. I mean, that would be, <laughs> that would be terrible, obviously. Right. So one thing I thought that was interesting is that maybe this will be the end of massive human conflicts, like where we have like lots of soldiers in places, like lots of troops on the ground. Mm -hmm. And maybe this will be the beginning of more like even more extreme cyber warfare, robot warfare, drone warfare. And so in the worst case, we could have a new either World War Three or Cold War type of scenario, which is really like a robot cyber drone war. And maybe we have other proxy countries where those get that get fought, but you know it could have lead to a lot of disastrous effects, especially when you consider how how reliant we are on technology. And if mm -hmm. you start having global powers knocking out other powers like power grid, or you know all their hospitals go down, their infrastructure goes down, you have this economic warfare. That to me seems somewhat likely now. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's. I think if we're looking at the broad strokes of history. Uh, I think that the age of, you know, strictly just force projection, uh, you know, boots on the ground, that kind of era is is on its way out and that we're moving mm -hmm. much more toward concerted kind of warfare. Uh, you know, so what you're describing where, you know, maybe they're attacking they, anyone, um, is, you know, focusing on infrastructure, right? Which is why some of the most key from my understanding, some of the most key uh, like infrastructure is air gapped, meaning it's not connected mm. to any network. It's just operated by people on the ground there. Um, so you'd probably see paradoxically or not paradoxically, you'd see intuitively, uh, you know, the, the defense against those kind of attacks would be uh, 
um, by actually reducing the amount of technology and how much any particular edifice is reliant on being connected to a network. Yeah. So if it's like if a dam is connected to some kind of network that regulates, I don't know, I don't know enough about dams, but there's like turbines or something that are connected by networks or something. Then yeah, like a know, hydropower. Yeah, exactly. Then you know that system is just air gapped, where it's not connected to any network, and there's just a physical, an internal network um, right. that you have to access physically. You know, I see that as being much more likely in the future. Maybe that's a good transition to get into the best case scenario. Best case scenario. Yeah, I mean, I think the best case scenario would be that there's a large group of people in Afghanistan who got used to like liberal rights um, and say, no, we actually rather quite like these. And that there is a decrease in poverty that leads to people being able to, uh, you know, not feel like they need to latch on to a sure thing, which is usually what, you know, reactionary forces like the Taliban provide. They provide a terrible, terrible thing, but it's a sure thing. You know what you're getting. Um, and that, you know, there isn't that stability, instability that leads to people latching on to that awful but sure thing. And that instead they latch on to, uh, and that they have aspirations for, you know, liberal democracy. I mean, that's what I would hope for. Is it likely? I don't really know. But, um, but you know, that's my hope is that you'd create a system where people have fundamental freedom uh, and rights and that that grows organically and that, uh, you know, as it relates to the U.S. and Afghanistan, that there's a recognition of our shared history, um, that, you know, there's some form of reconciliation there and that, you know, we would kind of operate in a similar way to how we operate now, I think with Vietnam, where we, we actively trade, uh, you know, with Vietnam. And I don't know too much about the internal circumstances there, but that we actually have a working relationship um, with the government and with the people and that, you know, we can increase the standards of living so that they are, uh, you know, in line with a vision of the world that is fundamentally liberal. Yeah, I would hope that that happens too. Uh, again, is it likely? I have no idea, but you know, I think that would be a best best case. Certainly, I've heard some news reports that there are people protesting in Afghanistan. That it's not like everyone is fully on the side of the Taliban. I saw these four ladies uh, who were, you know, dressed in traditional in their in their clothing and garb, which is you know pretty conservative, I think, for for most of us. Um, and they were holding up these signs, not even signs. They were just holding up pieces of paper, like shouting for their rights and protesting. And I thought, man, that takes <laughs> like, oh, do I have the courage to do that? Probably not. <laughs> but like, good for them. I mean, you know, yeah. if they're willing to stand up for what they believe in um, and stand up for their rights. I mean, just amazing. That takes a lot of courage. Shout out to those ladies. Yeah, well, I think I think you summarize what the best case is for Afghanistan. When we look at the world, the way I would summarize my best case scenario is that we transition from the Pax Americana to the Pax Bitcoinica. <laughs> and basically, we've had this period of peace since World War II. I was trying to look back at where do we actually put the original blame of what's wrong with the system? And it seems to me like, a lot of it does stem from the military industrial complex that did not lessen after World War II. So America had this major buildup in World War II. And then after the end of the war, there was a real question of, should we disband parts of the military? Should we still be spending so much money on it? And we had an opportunity to invest more in what's good for the regular citizens. But instead, we, we kept spending the same amount. And that led to overspending in wars like Vietnam, and Korea, you know, a, a lot of these Cold War conflicts. And because of how much America overspent, it, it led other countries to call our bluff as it relates to the gold standard. So we had England and France send ships to America to take the gold back in exchange for dollars because we had the gold standard back then. And that's what led to Nixon taking the U.S. off of the gold standard in 1971. 
So a lot of people would put the initial blame at Nixon for taking the U.S. off the gold standard. But the only reason he did that is because America had overspent so much already and gotten into so much debt already through the, the wars and the military industrial complex. So to me, like, I think that's one of the main origins of the problem. Yeah, I think what you're speaking to is almost maybe it's in parallel or it's a symptom of you know, a general problem, which is like a crisis of legitimacy, is that a lot of people around the world, now that they aren't as siloed within particular countries, have access to a lot more information and different ways of, you know, thinking or approaching something. Uh, and so, you know, most, most of the world and, you know, the, our governments and our structures rely on uh, faith and buy-in. And if you don't have that, then those are imperiled. Um, and so, you know, you have to I think it's incumbent on everyone to come up with a solution, which is uh, you know, a solution like there, you know, is ever anything that's so conclusive. But um, but you know, you have to come up with a way to approach uh, institutions which actually like verifies their um, and legitimizes you know the, their their uh, activities. There needs to be a there needs to not be a crisis of legitimacy. Hell, I don't know how to solve that, um, but you know that that seems to be kind of at the root of all of these different symptoms of what we're talking about. Well, the crisis of legitimacy is a really good way to distill it. I think this switch from the Pax Americana to the Pax Bitcoinica is inevitable because Bitcoin is a more efficient system, and it is it actually is more beholden to those liberal Western values than the current system where so many people are falling through the cracks now. Yeah, you know, I think the idea of there being some kind of objective verification is something that's lost in a lot of society today. Like a lot of people question, you know, the objective standards of, you know, what uh, any of our, uh, or, the, or they uh, label as subjective a lot of things that normally used to not be. Like an example would be beauty standards, right? People are now reconsidering, hey, what does it actually mean? Um, and so I think people are sort of thirsting for, uh, you know, some kind of objective standard. And I think that, you know, blockchain in particular provides that. Um, I think it's up to, you know, existing institutions to uh, maybe take those, <laughs> understand that people are thirsting for some kind of validator and to, you know, take and implement one that would work and that would actually demonstrate to people, hey, you know, there is a reason to buy into this system. You actually do have, there is responsiveness. There's mathematical certainty. It's not just like trust in the people in power. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't know enough about Bitcoin or blockchain or whatever to, to actually weigh in. Um, but I think that just even bringing it up is sort of a suggestion that there is the crisis of legitimacy and that so many people are looking to either reaffirm what already exists or, you know, greatly improve on it or whatever. One way I've heard it described is we're moving from a proof of war system to a proof of work. <laughs> because you look at the whole petrodollar fiat global system, that whole system relies on the military industrial complex and our treaties with Middle Eastern countries that produce oil. Whereas Bitcoin is based on proof of work, clean energy, and just mathematical certainty. Like you don't have to really trust in anyone other than the code itself. So maybe now let's talk about the most likely scenario. Most likely scenario. I think what's most likely is that there's less appetite on the part of most people in the United States to get involved in foreign ventures. Um, you know, mm -hmm. for, for better or for worse, I think that that's likely what will happen. Um, and that, you know, there is still that hunger for some kind of internal resolution to happen because there does seem to be, you know, a, a divide culturally in the country. And so, yeah, you know, people could turn to, um, that kind of external validator, whether it's blockchain or whatever. But I think that what, uh, I think that it's, incumbent on those institutions to figure out a way to solve that crisis of legitimacy. And is that likely? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, what that will mean, you know, for us is, is such a larger question for Afghanistan. I think that, uh, I think that's what, what is likely to happen is, 
for, uh, and I think we'll see it in probably the next few months or so, and probably a few years, is there will be the Taliban's government there will probably be testing to see how much they can take away from people um, and how much, you know, how much appetite there is for restraining people's uh, freedoms that they, you know, or, or customs that they might have gotten used to in the past, you know, 20 or so years. Um, hard to say what's most likely. I think it's, it remains to be seen. It's too early to say. Yeah, I would say, you know, it is really hard to predict what's going to happen. I would say going back to the theme of the sort of three orbs of power, the Western liberalism power, the authoritarian power, and then the Bitcoinica sovereign individual power, I think what's actually most likely is that we end up somewhere in the middle of that triangle. So we're going to have some influence of Western liberal values. We're going to have some influence of, hey, you can't do this. There are strict rules in place and some element of sovereign individualism where if you don't think that the people in power are doing what's best for you, well, the people can sort of rise up and self-determine their own future. And technology will enable that power to counter the other two forces. So I think it's probably most likely that we'll end up in the middle there, at least as a world. And certain places around the world, I think, will be much more concentrated in one aspect or another. And there will also be some no man's lands. Like I think Afghanistan is likely to be a really interesting no man's land where we'll kind of see which way does it sway naturally? Does it sway towards liberalism on its own? Does it get gobbled up by the CCP? Does it does some like decentralized blockchain economy kind of emerge from beneath? It's so hard to say, but that's why this is such a fascinating topic. It really is, I think, a harbinger of the great changes to come in our lifetime of technology and or, or, or even climate change or climate <laughs> when, change right? when you're talking about geopolitics i mean we're talking about a place at least afghanistan is incredibly hot already and you know people were probably likely to move if it's going to be much worse so you know all things are pretty much up in the air i don't want to strip the varnish off but th- there's so much up in the air it's it's hard to say yeah but I do like, I like to believe, and maybe it's just the optimist in me, but I believe that the long arc of history does bend towards truth, freedom, and justice. And I think there is something deep within humanity and just conscious beings in general where we're not willing to abide by things that aren't right for too long. Like things do get rectified over enough time. And so I'm very hopeful that, yeah, the next 10 years might be really tough. On, uh, with all the global changes taking place. But I, I really believe that the sovereign individualism will emerge as, the, as the, the winning force with those two other forces as kind of like balancing forces. And I think really it's for America, all America has to do is embrace the decentralized technology ecosystem that is already taking place. So I feel very optimistic if that occurs. Yeah, I, I think that there is, people need to be able to trust some kind of validator right and Mm -hmm. and so far it seems like there's been only deconstruction of all of those kind of validators and that there's going to be at some point maybe a resurgence of trust i don't know but i mean you're right transitions are happening and of course transitions are always scary well thanks so much brett for coming on to discuss these uh weighty topics yeah for sure thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time The past, the present, and the future.